Good afternoon. My name is Donna Lucas, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2014 season of She Shares, featuring our very special guest, Maria Shriver. Yeah. yeah. And I want to tell you what a great welcoming back for her. Uh, she just had a great time in that reception. She Shares is presented by the Dewey Square Group and is an official 501c3. And we are in partnership with the Center, California Center for Civic Participation. And we're dedicated to mentoring the next generation of women. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank a few folks. Secretary of State Deborah Bowen, right here in the front row. Thank you so much for your help and for giving us this auditorium. And I know we filled it to capacity, but thank you. And Congresswoman Doris Matsui, who represents the Sacramento area, <laughs> who has been a leader on economic issues for women in Congress and has been tremendous in her leadership in that. So thank you so much on that. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge two of our alumni speakers who are here, Nancy McFadden, the Governor's Chief of Staff, And Matina Cola Catronis, the president of the Sacramento Kings. Go Kings! Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank all of our sponsors. They're listed in the program. The sponsors have been with us for many, many, you know, since we started this a year and a half ago. Thank you so much for being here. And please take a minute to, to look at all the great sponsors that we have. It's only fitting that we start 2014 by welcoming Maria Shriver, our dear friend, who has been an inspiration to many of us and to women across the world. Uh, Maria w really inspired us to think about doing this program she shares when she did the Women's Conference because it was such an inspiring gathering of women. We wanted to create something like that here in Sacramento to continue those conversations. Maria, as you know, is the ultimate architect of change. Since serving as First Lady of California, she's been a bit busy. Um, she's been a special, she is currently a special anchor for NBC News. And she, this month, launched the Shriver Report, which is the third in a series of groundbreaking reports. This one is entitled, A Women's Nation Pushes Back, uh, and Women's Nation Pushes Back from the Brink. Uh, Maria has just had an outstanding uh, trip to Washington, D.C., where she personally briefed the president in the Oval Office on the findings of the report. And only two nights ago, during the president's State of the Union address, Sabrina Jenkins, one of the women featured in the report, was a guest of First Lady Michelle Obama. So you probably saw her on TV. Uh, I have to tell you, it is just such an amazing pleasure to welcome Maria Shriver and welcome her back. And we have our outstanding interviewer, Karen Breslau, who many of you know have done these tremendous interviews, who will join Maria on stage, as well as two special guests. But before we do that, we want to cue up this video and tell you a little bit about the Shriver Report. Thank you. There are 42 million women like this one, and this one, and this one. You see her every day, one house down or one desk over. The one teaching your children or going back to school herself. She works hard to hold down a job or even two to provide and parent, often without a partner, to juggle the needs of young children and elderly parents, to be the backbone of her family. She's the one doing it all because she has to. She is one missed paycheck, one sick child, one broken down car away from losing it all. You might know this one. She might be a lot like you. She could be looking to shatter the glass ceiling or just trying to stay on her feet. Oh, oh, oh. This one and the millions like her make up the foundation 
of our country. She keeps our families moving, our communities going, and our economy growing. She's the one 28 million kids depend on. We can't afford to let her down or count her out. So let's help lift her up. We are the ones. To add your voice and share your own story, visit tribalreport.org. What women need now. Welcome to She Shares, Maria. Welcome back to Sacramento. I think you can see that uh, people are more than ecstatic to see you back in town. I'm so. more than ecstatic to be back here. Yeah. Uh, as I wrote in the Sacramento Bee uh, this morning, I left uh, a large part of my heart in Sacramento. And uh, it's full being here and seeing so many people who uh, um, worked with me, have loved me, have uh, stayed in touch with me, have stayed uh, lifting me up and uh, have uh, really been what I would call faith keepers in a circle of trust. So uh, I'm thrilled uh, to be in this building, uh, the museum, which tells so many great stories of the people who founded the state, who made it what it is. Uh, it was one of the first things I got interested in when I came here as First Lady and to see uh, so many uh, people that I really care deeply about. So it's very emotional and very fun. fun. So much. The Shriver Report just came out this month to um, incredible acclaim. Mm -hmm. uh, Donna mentioned you, you met with the president personally in the Oval Office. Um, how about that? How about that? How about yeah, that? I wish, yeah, how about that? Now, and for me, I have to say that was a very moving thing because uh, not to name drop, but I've been in the Oval Office before. <laughs> have you now? Yeah, I had been in there a couple of times before when I was young and moving up, but it was, uh, for me, it was the first time I went in on my own steam. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the first time that I uh, sat there not, uh, you know, uh, for my work and the work of all the people that put on the Shriver Report and Karen and Olivia and the whole team. And uh, we sat in there and we were like, this is good. This is good. This is good. I have to tell a funny story. Yeah. Yeah. So when we were going on the train, we'd been because we were, um, was working for NBC during the week, and then we got the call that the president wanted to see us. So I was like, "Oh, that's great. That's good." So we're on the uh, train down, and Karen Skelton, who's the editor in chief of the report, was like, "You know, we have to prepare for the meeting." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, okay, I, I got it." And she's like, no, I am serious. I am, I am really serious. I want you to look right in the president's eyes. I want you to lean in. I want you, I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you're not making a move on him. What are you talking about? I'm like, she's like, this is serious. I don't want you kidding around. I, I'm like, I'm serious. I'm like, I know what I'm doing, OK? Like, oh. And she made me so nervous. But, but I was able to like, you know, kind of, I was like, I know what I'm doing. But anyway, she, it was very funny. She was like, <laughs> I was like sitting back, I was like, should I move? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so it was good, I was glad. Well, I, I thought you and Karen had actually uh, been under the stage during the State of the Union uh, writing the speech uh, during parts of it. When he said, when women succeed, America succeeds, what were you doing? Uh, watching. What, watching, yes. I was right. watching, right. and uh, right. as Doris Matsui said this morning, there have been so many people uh, in the Congress who have been working on these issues for so long. Uh, um, and in the capital and around the country. And uh, what we did when we went there, uh, and we were able to meet with Doris and Speaker Pelosi and so many uh, women who have been working and fighting for the issues that we talk about in the report. And the president said, look at, you know, these are issues I've lived. And um, I understand what you're talking about. When you talk about single mothers or you talk about people who are struggling on the brink, I, I know that story. And he said, well, what can I do? 
And I said, well, you could put somebody from the report in the State of the Union box with the First Lady. He goes, check. I thought, really? <laughs> and, and I was like, oh. Yes. And then, uh, you know, you act like, I, I want these three things. And then you, like, get them, and you're like, You walk out of your oh, yeah. oh my god, and um, and so you know it wasn't just us. It was obviously so many of the people, um, as I said, like Doris, who have been really advocating to get this front and center. That it's smart policy to invest in women. It's smart, it's smart economic policy, and what's good for women are good for their children, good for their partners, good for the bottom line, and good for the country. And uh, so we had issues of pay equity that we spoke with him about, issues uh, of the polling that came out that sick leave would make a tremendous difference in the lives of uh, working women. And he hit every note. And so I was like, yeah. you know, whoa. It was a mess. That was great. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I have to write him a thank you note. <laughs> Handwritten. I, I want to ask you about what you found during these years that you worked on uh, this report. Did you have any idea that you were going to find the numbers of women living on the brink that, that you found? I mean, one in three in this country, right. which is just a, a stunning percentage. Um, I didn't know what the exact numbers would be, yeah. but I think uh, the Shriver reports were really born out of the work of the Women's Conference. And uh, so many people in this room worked on that conference. And when we were programming that conference, you could see that there was a hunger uh, from people for information, whether it was on breadwinning, whether it was on caretaking, caregiving, Alzheimer's, uh, whether it was women who couldn't get access to programs. So we knew that there was something going on and that really nobody had done in 50 years since Daddy ran the War on Poverty a really you know, comprehensive look at what was the state um, of poverty today in the United States and how had that face changed from the 60s when it was a person living in Appalachia or inner city. And what we came to find it was the face of a working woman who was working and taking care of a child and taking care of a parent. And it really, I thought, brought the three reports together because the first one had been about women kind of moving into the workforce and being primary breadwinners. The second had centered on Alzheimer's as a woman's disease, but the millions of people who care give and how you have to change your job in order to you drop in, you drop out, and how that affects your earnings, how that affects your savings. And this one really told the story of what happens, um, you know, through a series of life choices, um, how you can end up like that on the brink. And really, it really tried to also say it's not just government's responsibility. It, business plays a role in here, women themselves, men play a role in this and really to try to change the face of that issue, change the language around the issue, and change the conversation. And I think we were successful on all those fronts. You mentioned your father. Sergeant Shriver led the war on poverty for President Johnson uh, 50 years ago. And uh, as you just described, the, the situation and the, the challenges are so different today. Mm -hmm. But in what way did his work inform what, what the work that you have just completed and are, are continuing to? Well, I think uh, even though I lost both of my parents in the last four years, they're still yakking up here, you know? Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, daily, uh, hourly. Um, I don't think you can grow up like I grew up and not have their work uh, inform uh, my work. So um, uh, I think, you know, and I think everything, whether it was work I did on the Women's Conference, work I did in journalism, uh, you know, all of it kind of culminates uh, together. So I, I've always been interested in people's stories who got knocked down and got up. I've always been inspired by people's emotional, spiritual courage. And um, so, you know, I grew up listening to people's stories like that. So. I think, you know, at the end of the day, the Shriver Report is a journalistic endeavor. It's a report, and uh, it seeks to inform and inspire and ignite an impact. And uh, so my father's work uh, informs my work, but so does my mother's uh, rage and anger and determination informs my work. And really, the, the people that I've met, they inform my work, the women that I met at the conference, their stories, uh, the people I meet in my reporting, 
the team that we work with. You know, I think it's really important to say that this is a um, a product of you know so many people's work who could be making a lot more money working someplace else and who chose out of passion and mission uh, and a belief that they could make a difference, worked on this report with a difficult subject yeah. and uh, made it mainstream. And I think one of the people uh, who contributed to that report is someone we would very much like to invite up now to join us. And that is Karen Skelton, the editor-in-chief of the Schreiber Report. <laughs> Who is known and admired by just about everybody in this room. Come here. <laughs> lean, <laughs> lean in, lean in, baby, lean, lean in. in. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. A, a big part of She Shares is about mentoring the next generation of women leaders. And I think a lot of people think mentorship and, mentorship and they think this is somebody in high school, this is somebody in college. But the relationship you two have is one of mutual mentoring. And it started really here in Sacramento. Yeah, it started uh, one of the, when I came to Sacramento, you know, I, I, I mean, it's a whole other She Shares. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go, we're going to go off the brink if we go over there, but uh, anyway, so you know, you have to find a chief of staff, which I was like, oh wow. Anyway, so I met Karen then and asked her to be uh, my chief of staff and she said no, and because she had two young children and just moved back. And so then we just, then she came and we started working on the women's conference uh, and she began to assemble a team and I began to assemble a team and so many, as I said, the people are here and then the Shriver reports were born. and. Uh, she has definitely uh, taught me a tremendous amount uh, about building a team, about leading, about uh, being focused, about making a difference, and about friendship and about loyalty. And this third report would not be here today if it weren't for Karen, because um, I lay down in the beginning on it, and she lifted me up and pushed me forward. And um, when I didn't think I had it in me, she said I did. And for sure it wouldn't be here. That's true. Yeah. So Maria talked about, yeah. talked about you know, how um, awestruck she was in a way by being in the uh, Oval Office with the President. And I admit, I, I, I was too. But sitting here with Maria makes me feel that way because um, you know, I joke with her that you know, I don't have all of the status that she has and the um, glamour that she has and the platforms that she has, but we have a lot in common. We're very scrappy and we have journalism in our blood and um, we're really hard workers and I've never worked with somebody really as hard working as Maria is. And on this report, every it was really hard as a lot of you know. I mean, I look at people who have been, you know, from the beginning, Nancy and Jillian and, you know, Carl and, I mean, Donna. We Aaron. Were, Aaron. We're Everybody. Right there. Yeah, everyone. Right there. everyone. Aaron. I don't want to start naming names because, you know, but especially Aaron. And But it was <laughs> really, really, really hard to write about women and poor women. Who wants to cover that? You know, raising money around it was really, really hard, as yeah. many of you know. Um, and Maria made this report come to life because she really believed that telling the story of these women in English, yeah. with emotion, with a premium on the visual, with all the platforms, our award-winning photography, two of the photographers are here today, Barbara Kinney and Barbara Reese, you know, um, they, 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 because Maria understood, um, you know, the power of a story, even of a poor woman, and the difficulty of telling that in a way that people would listen to it, um, that's why we, we were successful. That's why we sat in the Oval Office, because we had a story to tell, and she knew how to do it. And it was, and it was this team, really, as she said, I just want to say, I mean, the mentoring piece of this, I get a lot more credit than is due to me, because there is no way that there's not one person who worked on this project without whom it would have been a success, not one. We had very little money, we had very few people, we had to ask everybody for help, and we did all the time. And that's why it was successful. I think that's a really 
a great point is that um, because the, the Shriver Report is an initiative of a woman's nation, which is a nonprofit, and Donna sits on the board, and Sandy and Aaron runs it, and Jillian helps, and Nancy. And uh, when we went to kind of talk about this project, people that I called and they were like, well, you know, I don't really, I'm, women in poverty isn't really my interest. And I said, well, this isn't what you think it is. And it's, you know, women who are on the brink. These are women who are working. They may be sitting next to you. These are everyday Americans. Um, these numbers are immense. And people said, well, you know, I'm kind of interested in children in distress. I'm like, they have mothers. Like, sure. let's connect the dots. But I think that the idea, and I've met so many young people when I was getting coffee across the street, and I would just like to say to them, you know, that you have to ask for help all along the way in your life. And um, it's really important because you can't get anywhere uh, in life without asking for help and without assembling a team and without your friends really helping you all along the way. And um, we asked everybody for help with this project and got turned down a lot, a lot. And um, really through, as I said, you know, everybody on it could have gone off and made a lot more money, gone someplace else. And as, um, it just is, I think, a real testament to a team approach, finding people who have a similar mission in your life, um, similar kind of sense of humor, <laughs> uh, similar scrappiness, as uh, Karen said, and, um, and an ability to say, you know, it's not about your pride. I'm going to ask people to help me. And we all need help. Karen, one of the biggest elements of the project that you oversaw was this huge uh, nonpartisan poll, uh, nationwide poll. And what were some of the most surprising findings when you, when you talked to women living on the brink? What, are, what is it they want? Um, well, I'd say and me. Yeah, um, it was a really interesting poll. It was uh, the margin of error on it for those of you who are junkies is one point you know six percent. So it was a very big poll, um, and it was done by Republican pollsters and Democratic pollsters. And um, one of the really interesting findings was that um, when we we told people half of the babies born in the United States are born to women under thirty are born to single parents. So just think about that for a second. There's a, the, the family structure has changed. So we asked people, what do you think should be done about that? Do you think government should put its resources into supporting families and the, and the traditional family structure? Or do you think government should adapt to the reality of the way the family is today and support it regardless of the status? And the poll found that um, while a ma bare majority of the people thought government had a role in encouraging marriage, um, two-thirds of the people thought that government should adapt to the reality of how America exists today. And in California, um, and we've never, we didn't really publish this number, but, but and that, this is, we haven't really talked about it, but Californians even more so, 76% of Californians thought that the world's changed, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, and you need to have a government that adapts to the reality of today. And that's a big thesis of our report, which is that the world has changed. And it's especially changed for women. The workplace has changed, family structures changed, education is more important than ever, especially for girls and harder to get. And so we have to, as a country, adapt to that. And I think California, as in many things, is on the front edge of that. Um, you know, the number one thing that women on the brink want and need is sick time. Paid sick leave. I Paid sick 96%. leave. Ninety-six percent. That ninety-six that percent. That was amazing. It was interesting, and Congresswoman Matsui has been such a leader on this in the House. It's interesting that there is bipartisan support for the solutions. Men, women, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives. They're in the numbers are high. So paid leave, pay equity, closing the pay gap, raising the minimum wage. Um, you know, it's time. And I think another interesting little piece of the poll, which we didn't really spend a lot of time on, is has to do with um, regrets. And we asked a lot of questions about what would you do different in life. And overwhelmingly, people said, especially women on the brink, that they would have stayed in school longer. It's the number one thing. But they also said um, on the question of divorce, um, many, many more men regret getting out of a marriage than women. <laughs> So it was like, that's interesting. 
So it's like 50% of the men regretted it and 23% of the women. <laughs> and for women on the brink, you know, you know, if you're not holding your weight as a guy, you just better move on out because this, you know, your wife's not going to hold you. She's holding together the family. She's caretaking for elderly parents. She's trying to raise, you know, the kids and go to work. And if you're not holding your weight, mm, but I think, I, I think what's also really important is that it is easier to raise a child with two incomes. Absolutely. It, it just is. Sure. And I think it, it is easier to stay above the brink if you have an education. And I think what this report also did is it said to women in particular, be smart mm -hmm. and get smart. Because the world out there is, is a very different place, as Karen said. And you will end up being a provider as opposed to someone to be provided mm -hmm. for. And I think really trying to encourage women uh, to uh, not think that someone's going to ride in here on a white horse and pay all your bills and ride out. You know, that, but that it, it behooves you to be smart financially, um, to stay in school, to think about uh, family planning, and to think about uh, who the partner is that you go through life with, not, you know, as I say to my daughters, you're spending all this time talking about your wedding, where's the guy? You know, like, hello, you know, so, you, uh, you know, you have to, like, put as much attention into the person as the dream, right? And so I think there's a lot of things in the report that people can do, individuals can do themselves, uh, whether you hire people to take care of a parent or your child, because there's an entire society uh, that comes up underneath of women going out to work, right? Pay people a living wage. Give them sick days if they are uh, working in your home or in your small business. And there, be a 21st century employer. And I think that there is, as I said, a lot of things that can be done personally, things that businesses can do uh, in dialogue with people who work for them. There's a great deal in the report about retention. Mm -hmm. uh, and that also, you know, men need these things too. And I think Absolutely. that's a really important thing yeah. that this, I, I'm a big believer that none of these issues, whether we're talking about uh, the workplace, whether we're talking about domestic violence, whether we're talking about relationships, unless we bring men um, in a compassionate way into the conversation. And so whether we have sons to raise them with emotional intelligence, uh, whether we have daughters to raise them with emotional intelligence about men and about boys. And uh, men are not the enemy. Men are the partners in all of this. And um, I think that that's a really, uh, in this new year, something that any of us who work in the women's space, uh, it is a family space. It's a humanity space. Mm -hmm. And to bring men into this discussion and into this dialogue and uh, to make them partners and be a part of is a really critical thing in our language and in our tone, as I talk to my daughters about tone all the time. <laughs> tone. <laughs> I don't like your tone. <laughs> or your words. <laughs> or your attitude, or the clothes you have on. <laughs> or that guy. <laughs> I, I thought one of the most moving essays, and there are so many in this report, yeah. was from LeBron James, who wrote, a tribute to his, uh, to the single mother who raised him. Right. And on this amazing day when you were at the White House oh, yeah. uh, meeting the president, <laughs> LeBron James also happened to be at the White House because the uh, heat were being honored. Yeah. Uh, and you had an encounter there at the White House with LeBron. Well, we had an interview with LeBron. Yeah, an yeah. interview. So, of yeah. course, we've been trying to get, you know, LeBron very, it was great. He gave, um, uh, wrote this essay with Roberta Hollander, who's not here, and to contribute to this. And of course, we were trying to get him to do an interview on NBC's Impossible, Impossible. And then all of a sudden, we look down at the schedule. He's at the White House on the same day. So we jump on a train. The NBC producer, we go running to the gate, and the NBC producer forgets her ID. And she's like, stage there. She's like, come on, I'm just going to get in NBC. They're like, no. No way, no how, no. And so we're going, and I was going to do a nightly thing. We had to do a. Um, uh, an interview, and uh, so we're, we're like standing at the gate, and they're like, only you two can go in, and Sandy, who worked on the conference, he used to work with me for 25 years, you know, I was like, Karen, you are now the producer of Nightly, she's like, I don't know how to do it, I don't know how to do it, and I'm like, it doesn't matter, we are running, and so we were like, running I started down. at the top, yeah, so, so running, and they're like, 
you know, like they're running to a room, they're going, in here, here come the whole heat. And we're like, oh, LeBron, of course, you know, when we, when we do the interview, and he talked very eloquently about uh, the love his mother gave him and the support and the decisions uh, mm -hmm. that she made and how now as a father himself, he couldn't imagine uh, what she had gone through or how she was able to do it. And um, then when we were, we were finished, then we had to go running in and do the nightly piece. And I'm like, Karen, go out and get the camera. She's like, well, 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 where is this? <laughs> like, go out there. Go out there. But uh, it was like one of those kind of comedies. Surprise, the Aaron's. union wasn't all over you. Well, all the, all the heat started walking out, and I was like, maybe I should interview all of them. You know, like the yeah, we basically <laughs> camped out at the White House. We, yeah, you know, sorry. we got in and we mm. just used it. Yeah. <laughs> Going from meeting she, to eat meeting. We were, we were in the lobby. things to steal, actually. In <laughs> no. There, like, no, we were no. in the West Wing um, lobby, and, you know, people are coming in and out for meetings. And so Henry Kissinger came in and out. The vice president was in and out. And Maria kept shoving the Shriver report in their hands and taking pictures. <laughs> <laughs> we go, look at all the men who are reading the Shriver yeah, report. Yeah. We were tweeting it out from the West Wing. <laughs> Everybody just inadvertently walked up next to us. Right. Maria shoved the I report. I said, it's very important to show men reading this report. So LeBron James like, what? I was like, let me just stand and take the picture. <laughs> yeah. And the vice president was like, what are you doing here? I was like, OK, here's this report. Just stand right there. He's like, oh, okay. he says, do you want the Joint Chief Staff? I'm like, yeah, I want them to. <laughs> but uh, pictures, obviously. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, tell a huge story. And um, I think the other thing, and Barbara is, Karen said Barbara Kinney is here, and uh, these pictures of uh, really everyday life, these are the stories of Americans. And I'm, there's two things that I also think are really important about this report is so much, I think, about women's empowerment deals with the 1%. It's talking about achieving the corner office, breaking the glass ceiling, um, and you know, most women are, you know, taking care of their families, their husbands, their partners, or they're going it alone. They're working, they're volunteering, they're taking care of aging parents, you know. They are looking for a foundation. They are looking for some help uh, to conduct their lives in a way that makes them proud and where they can give their children a life that's better than theirs. And this report, I think, really looks at, I think, um, people holistically, which is what we also tried to do at the conference, that, you know, that it's not, you can't just tell someone to be financially literate or the job. It's really, um, you know, you can have a lot of money and be on the brink emotionally or spiritually. Uh, you can be rich and be poor in your soul. And we really tried, I think, in this report to look at the effects of raising a child, for example, in a stressful environment. So mm -hmm. even if the mother you know, doesn't have a job, what is the effect on the brain of the child? What is the effect on the health? Um, I'm looking at Daniel, who you know, supported us through the California Endowment. And when we talk about health, we really try to talk in this report about the overall health. Uh, because you, know, you have to work with people. And I think that's one thing we learned through We Connect and everything, that it's you know, you have to look at the whole human being, right? And it's Absolutely. about, uh, you know, people can lift themselves up if they believe in themselves. And uh, we had a meeting this morning with so many women who are benefits of nonprofits here in Sacramento who talked about addiction and domestic violence and parents who weren't there. And people are trying to do their best. And um, they, they, it's tough. It's tough for people, and that's why I was so, I'm so proud of this report, because it talks about people who don't get spoken about a lot. You talked about the fact that the report is so um, filled with the stories of real people, and we're extremely happy that we have one of our... A real person. A real person. <laughs> oh, my God. No, uh, a, 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 um, a woman who is featured in the Strive Report in this amazing photojournalism project that Barbara Kinney led. Uh, with a team of women photographers who traveled all over the country. And I want to introduce uh, Bini Pradhan, who is from San Francisco. And while Bini's coming to the stage, I just want to let everybody know you got question cards when you came in. And so we'll be collecting those. You can send those to the aisle. And when we get to the q and I'll be glad to get as many as I can. There's Bini. Bini. Welcome. Thank you. We're thrilled to have you. And I'm honored to be here. <laughs> you run a business in San Francisco, yes. Beanie's Kitchen. Right. 
Um, you uh, work 18 hours a day, I understand. Right. It has increased now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but you came to it, you, you started uh, with an experience of life on the brink. Yes. You were living a middle class life. Yes. You were married. Right. You had a young child. You had an excellent education, a degree in culinary arts from Mumbai, India. You right. worked as an executive chef right. uh, in top restaurants. Right. And then one day, it all changed. And right. Could you tell us what happened? Um, sorry. Sorry, uh, bear with me. I am not a good speaker, but I'm a good chef. I can cook. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, 2011, October 11th, I walked out of the, uh, my uh, house with my little son, who was then two years old. We had a marriage for seven, seven years. Um, full, I was um, verbally, sexually, and physically abused for seven years. And I left my career, I left everything for just for him. He, um, and the day came out that I had to save my, I had a choice whether to stay with him or I can um, save my son and myself. So I took a chance and I had a Nissan Sentra and I put his stuff, all his stuff, including his city cup, so that he could, wherever I go, I didn't know. I walked out, I drove and and um, I went to a shelter and it's like I didn't have a penny I didn't know what what I'm gonna do what's gonna happen and because I had uh, no connection with my family my family family my sister my brother-in-law they are the family here because of them I'm here today and um, I just they, they were not even aware because um, I had to cut my uh, cut relationship with them so I went to the um, shelter mm -hmm. and I stayed there I didn't know I didn't know what's gonna happen what I'm gonna do I didn't have a penny I just went there and that was the first step I took and um, I'm proud of that because because there are there are people who doesn't really who who doesn't say but I think you can make it so that way um, I started there and then the second day I called my sister she was not even aware in fact she called me out of blue and um, she just asked me what happened uh, because of my voice after two years I hadn't spoken and I just cried I'm sorry <laughs> and um, and uh, I cried and she asked me then I did speak to her and immediately the next morning my brother-in-law and my sister they came to pick me up. So um, from there, I went to her house and I stayed there uh, for a month. And then uh, she has been, I started my uh, first, besides of me working into a different, um, uh, different culinary places, that was the time because um, my son, Ayush, was set two years old then. Then I couldn't work, I was a homemaker. So um, since then, like the first, I started cooking from her house. Then I, um, then I started from there slowly, slowly, because she runs a preschool daycare. So from her clients, one to another, I just started. And um, eventually, after three months, I found uh, a place called La Cucina, which is a nonprofit organization where, uh, where they help a woman like me. And then that also, I was not sure whether I'm going to get it. And there were 1,500 applicants. And I didn't have any place to put my son because he was two years old and he didn't know what's going on. So my sister took me in a, um, both of us in her, uh, in her arms and immediately the second day she took, her, she took my son to the daycare, the same daycare where she runs. She didn't care about anything, just at least I knew now my son is in a safe place. Nobody is gonna do anything to him. Then I started going to places to places, looking for jobs, and in the side way, I started doing babysitting. And then on the side, and when I got through of this place, I applied and I, went, I didn't know that I was gonna get through. So I got a call, then I started from there. Slowly, slowly, it's like now it's been a year and a half. I'm in La Cucina. It's an awesome organization. There's a, there, there are a bunch of staff 
there's Michelle today, there is from La Cucina, and um, it's like they helped me to to get through where I am today. Now my food runs uh, to Whole Foods and most of San Francisco Whole Foods, a lot of catering companies and uh, Sausalito and soon I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna increase my business. It's the Nepalese cuisine. Um, besides that now I have um, at least two employees who runs full time with me and I'm coming up with more so that we I can help more people and especially women who who are, who are into a brink like me. I guess I think that's so inspiring. I, I it just is. I think like I could like listen to her all day long. I just think that's just so great. From the from the brink to being a small business owner and employing other women. Right. And along the way, obviously you you worked incredible hours, you had a vision, right. you you made a lot of the personal you took a lot of the personal solutions that Maria talks about. Did you have any uh, assistance from any public sector programs? No. I did not. Once I had applied and then they said that I have a Nissan Sentra, so it comes with five thousand dollars, so that's that's the award which I have. So they cannot help me out. <laughs> I, I mean, yes, <laughs> and then my sister is the one, Sunita right there. She's the Hi. one a great person. <laughs> and she put her she she's the one who still helps me out. Whenever I'm there, it's like I'm in need. She's the one I go to. And um, it's like, it's, no, I did not uh, get any assistance. I think it's interesting, Beanie's story, because, um, you know, the stereotype of poverty is that somebody's living homeless, somebody's, um, you know, African American in the inner city on a stoop, or the Appalachian, you know, scruffy kid on a porch. And Maria, from the very beginning, you know, want, ma you know made us focus on language and, and the language of our story. Beanie's story breaks through all those stereotypes. She wants to succeed. She wants to stay married. She wants to work. <laughs> she's talented. She's now starting a business. And when we think of America and the women living on the brink, it's that kind of story that we tried to break through on. And the language around it is, is so important, which is, you know, it's really a tribute to, to, to Maria's, uh, you know, s storytelling passion. Um, and, and I think that's why we were able to break through. And you also see in your story, I feel like an English teacher now, you know, going through <laughs> a poem or something, but, you know, the need for daycare and childcare for moms. You know, you just can't go back to work without it. Right. I think also the, you know, you have a family or you have a family that supports mm -hmm. her. And so many of the people are supported by family, but a lot of people aren't. And so I think, uh, you know, there is a whole debate which we kind of landed into you know the war on poverty was a real failure and everything was terrible well that's actually not true as i explained to congressman ryan that's not accurate and uh so i but i and i and i also said to him i think it's so wonderful actually that congressman ryan and senator rubio are now in this discussion because i think it will take republicans and democrats and decline to states to fix um, the economic insecurity that so many millions of Americans face. And Head Start, which was a program that Daddy started, does work. Uh, the Job Corps, Vista, Legal Services for the Poor, uh, does work. They do work when they are funded so that mm -hmm. they can work. Uh, we Connect, which we started and which the endowment now runs, which brings uh, programs together, government programs that are meant to serve people who are temporarily or not in economic distress, um, those programs work. So it's not about kind of a blanket statement, everything was terrible and no one needs these programs. Or You know, some people do and some people don't. Right. And I think some people are blessed with family, right? Some right. people are not. Some people do need food stamps. Some people need health care. Some people need uh, job corps. Some people need legal services. There's so many things, and that's why I think the, the role of government is there. Um, but so is the role of business, and so are the roles of nonprofits, 
and it's once again a holistic approach uh, and that I, helps I, people. I think that's one of the things you do so effectively in the report is, is this isn't about big government, this is about uh, this is about solutions from the public sector, from business, uh, the decisions that women like Beanie make themselves. Um, we are running short on time, uh, but I do know that there are questions out there, and so if we can get the question cards, we will start. That's Sean. Those. There we go. Hi, Sean. Sean. Okay. Sean. All right. All right, here's a good one. How can we change social policy so that services are available for those that need a bridge? Many of these women are not looking for a continuous handout, but only for some help, a, a hand up. Well, I think, uh, first of all, one of the things that I found as First Lady was there are a lot of programs, but nobody knows about them. And I think that's something that government does very poorly, is it passes laws and forgets to tell people that, that they're there. <laughs> so I think this is something we talked about uh, when I was First Lady. I was like, if you had a movie, you wouldn't make a movie and not tell anybody it was there. Or if I put out a book, I go on a tour and I make sure everybody knows about it. Uh, and that was really the, the point of We Connect, was to say these programs, whether it's the Earned Income Tax Credit, whether it's food stamps, whether it's working with legal services, there are programs that are there for a bridge. But we, meet, we need to inform people, we need to give them access, and it needs to go where people are. You know, it's very hard to be economically insecure, to have the time to sign up for these sure. programs. You don't get sick days, so where are you going to get the time? You don't get flight You don't have a time. car, you, mm -hmm. where are you going to drive to pick them up? So there are things that government can do that would bring government itself up to the 21st century. It needs to modernize, smart app. Uh, you know, we, we looked at, Jillian there looked at trying to figure out an app that would be called To You, which would bring programs to people where they are. Uh, so there are things I think that government can be more innovative about uh, and that we can all be more creative. Government doesn't really kind of, when you think of government, I don't think you think of creativity, um, but I think there are people who want to be creative. And, and the reason this is so important too, just quickly, is that half of all Americans will live in poverty for at least two or three months in their lifetime. Poverty. Yes. So, I mean, it's really important that the bridge be found. Right. Yeah, still, I'm not even, every day for me, it's like in financial insecurity. Like when I'm gonna, I'm not gonna work, and then it's like, besides like I might be in the street, that fear every, every time comes when I'm going to bed. It's like, so everybody like, it's hard. I just want to go down the road quickly and ask, what policy would you like to see change to reflect the modern workforce? What is, what is one thing? I think sick days. I think you have two, two people working uh, or one person as a single parent. And I think that we can do better as a society to make people choose between leaving a child at home sick or sending a child to sick. I mean, it's so hard to say one policy because it's not gonna be one policy. It's not one thing. And that's why this is complex. And as I say, it's, it's gonna take great ideas and create out ideas from both sectors. Um, but I think that was universally, if you could come up with one right. thing. And we we uh, saw legislation introduced in California yeah. to do exactly Helpful that. about that. Um, I agree with Maria, there's no silver bullet. I really am committed to the public, private, and personal solutions that, it, that we talk about in the book, but if I had to pick one government solution, I, I think that the um, wage gap is the biggest civil rights issue of our time. I think there's no reason to explain why women make 77 cents for a man's dollar, except that they're discriminated against. And so I would try to change that policy by making enforcement of the law that exists stronger. Beanie, what would you, what, I agree what policy on, would you like uh, to on their they're safe. I totally agree. <laughs> okay. And I, I, would, I would look as I, as I look at everything as a journalist and I look at everything about conversation and tone and uh, I really think a big universal thing that we can be more compassionate, mm -hmm. uh, more empathetic, more caring to every person, uh, you know, in our debate, in our debate so that we recognize the stories of every American. 
um, and our tone in our debate on television, on the floor, and I include myself in that as a journalist, um, and as parents, I think we can do better in creating, as I say in the report, a more compassionate, caring, conscious society and culture. Uh, and I think that starts with each of us, and I think we should demand it of our leaders. Because the tone, uh, whether it's on television or on the floor, is um, unacceptable. You learned a lot from being a Democratic First Lady in a Republican administration. You, you talk about learning to deal with people on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. What did you learn during your years here in Sacramento that you think could be exported to policymakers elsewhere? Well, I think first and foremost, I learned that the other party is not the enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think many people come into uh, public life and campaigns really um, hating the other side. Maybe not the person that's running it, maybe, but maybe the person, that, but also the people that work. It's a very competitive, and they think that the other um, team is the enemy. And I think that uh, we all lose with that mm -hmm. concept. And then when I think people do try to bring in other people with other parties, you know, people, you can't do that. You can't have a Democratic chief of staff, or you can't have a Republican chief of staff. And uh, the first chief of staff I had was a Republican, Donna Lucas. And uh, then I had uh, Daniel, uh, who I remember shutting the door one day in the first lady's office and said, who is we? Who's on our team here? And uh, who are we here? And because uh, he was a Democrat and then Holly Mann. Uh, but I think um, I learned a lot because I was, um, and then obviously Arnold had a Democratic uh, chief of staff after a Republican chief of staff. And I think that's really healthy uh, in a state that has so many declined estates and in a state that is leading. I think um, I'm really heartened. I think you go back and you look at Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, or when I watched my uncle Ted Kennedy um, with his relationship with Orrin Hatch or John McCain, that's the only way anything is going to happen. It's not going to happen by blaming the other side. And there are really good people with an R next to their name, just as our people need to know there are really good people with Ds next to their name. And I was not raised, I might add, in that environment. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, uh, I think the first Republican I met was Arnold. And, uh, <laughs> I, um, but it, you know, and I think people kind of, you know, they, we watch our own television now. Sure. We congregate with people who think like you and who talk like you and hold the same beliefs as you. So I try to watch Fox. I try to watch mm -hmm. MSNBC. I try to surround myself with young people, old people who have different political opinions because otherwise you're not really living in, you know, the way it is. But I, I do think and maybe that's part of what's happening in California with open primaries and you know, mm -hmm. losing the, um, the D or the R that we can look at the man or the woman. And I think that's one of the things we also say in this report that every single person in here has the power of their vote. Don't give it away. Uh, give it to a person who's talking about the issues that you are talking about and that you need. There is tremendous power in our voice and in our ballot box. That's why we have the system we have. So if Alzheimer's or caregiving is an issue for you, demand that the person you're voting for talk about it. Mm -hmm. If sick days or living wage or minimum wage is an issue for you, demand that that man or that woman speak to those issues. We have that right, and if we don't ask for it, I think as Doris would say, we're not gonna get it. Right. And I would say also to women, 54% of the electorate you know, it's a lot. Pull it together. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. on that on that note, uh, we, we, could go, we could go on for a long time, but we we have run out of time today. I just want to ask. Yeah. Uh, I know you're in charge, but I just want to ask uh, <laughs> that all the people who had anything to do with the Shriver report would they please stand? Because I want, and I said I met young people in the back and stuff like that. I want them to see how many people, and this is only part of. But there's a lot of people here who made it happen, who worked, who are on the board, and who participated, who aren't sitting up here. Yeah. And if they could just stand, stand for up. one second. Daniel, Donna, up. Margaret, Sandy, Aaron, Jillian, Is Bixby here?
Yes. Oh, her daughters and husband. <laughs> Stand up. All right, I'm going to take charge again. You are? Yeah. Well, I wanted to have some more questions from the crowd. Some more questions. All right, well, let's take, let's see. We're, we're uh, going to strain our webcast a little bit. That's but okay. Nobody's watching. <laughs> my mother is watching. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'm sure my mother's watching from heaven. Yeah. <laughs> so much of your career has been spent investigating the stories of real women's lives. Mm -hmm. From these conversations, what have you learned about yourself as a woman? Why'd you take that question? Because... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's another she shares. No, I actually, I, I, uh, in uh, listening to your story and uh, so many people's stories, uh, that uh, you can get through anything. Yes. You can get through anything. Yes. And when you don't think you can get through anything. Right. <laughs> On those wise words, I am now going to end. I want to thank the incredible hardworking staff at the Dewey Square Group, led by Tamara Torlakson, Taylor Greenberg, Julia Wright, Ali Maloney, Angela Pontes. Thank you all, and thank you all for coming to She Shares. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add, I want to add one thing before, before we go today. We, we mentioned this incredible photojournalism project that Barbara Kinney uh, led. We have some beautiful photos that we're going to show you, and we hope that as we take our leave, you'll take a few minutes to watch uh, some of these beautiful images. Uh, and download the report. And download the report. Tribalreport.org. Yes, or Amazon. Or Amazon. Read the report. Implement it if you can, cite it, look at 10 things you can do, help us continue to do this work. And, and watch the and watch yes, the and look at the 10, 10 things, things you can do. Every, and watch the documentary. And watch the documentary. Everybody on out. HBO, watch paycheck to paycheck. We have more things to talk about. Watch the Donate. HBO. Yes. Have a house party. Yeah, have a house party, invite the conversation. Do something. For God's sake, do something. Okay. All right. Oh, wait, we're going to see the show. No. Yeah, everything.